So today's class is about critical appraisals and how they're incorporated into systematic reviews uh, across across multiple systematic reviews. So each each researcher, each systematic review protocol, each each uh, journal has slightly different criteria for how appraisals are done and how they're used in journals. And we're going to talk about sort of the, the variety of options you have available to you. So first of all, why do we do critical appraisals? I brought this up a little bit in the first class, but I brought up a lot of stuff in the first class, so I'm going to go over it again. Um, and the first thing to note is that you don't always do them. Not all systematic reviews require them. Scoping reviews typically don't include them at all because scoping reviews are more inclusive in nature than systematic reviews are. Um, and they're only done on the articles you've decided to keep. So after you've done your full text screening, you do the critical appraisal on the ones you have left over, which is more sane because hopefully there aren't 200 of them. Um, and what they do is they evaluate the quality of the research you're looking at. And they ask, uh, I'll get into questions, um, but their purpose is to, to make sure that, I mean, you're drawing a conclusion from lots and lots of research, but is that conclusion valid? Uh, like, it does, is the research good enough to support a conclusion on this level? Um, and ideally, when you're doing a critical appraisal of an article uh, for a systematic review, you're using you're doing it so that you can sort of weight things or remove articles. So if you if you do critical appraisal and you have like ten questions and it fails on four of them, that article is not very good. You might want to either treat it differently when you're when you're when you're doing your analysis, or just take it out of the take it out of the appraisal entirely or take it out of the systematic review entirely. Um, And sort of one more thing before I move into like how they're incorporated and stuff is, uh, like everything else in systematic reviews, you have to record your stuff about critical appraisals. So keep a record of why you rejected each article. And this is this is tedious. Keep a record of, or not not, the, not why you rejected it, but what it scored and why it scored what it what it got. Um, and this is just because you record everything in systematic reviews. Someone's going to ask you. You might you might be doing like there might be two people on your team doing critical appraisals. You might disagree with someone. You need to know why you disagree with them and where where that point of contention was. Um, and if you just can if you're arguing over one question and the same question, it's easy to go back to your notes as opposed to go back to the full text article to to resolve those issues. Um, and as I'll as I'll point out a little later on, some systematic some systematic reviews actually include tables of this information. So you recorded it and actually put it in the article saying, here's a critical appraisal for each article, here's what I noted about the things that it said. So sometimes it's actually publishable information, as most of this recorded stuff is. It's published in supplementals, it's published in the actual article itself, depending on where it's going. So JBI reviews, and I'll talk a bit about them too. Um, JBI reviews and Cochrane reviews tend to be very long and they include all of this supplemental information that you're recording as you go. They include your critical appraisals and your search strategies for all of your databases and your extraction data and like all of that actually gets published. Uh, so note that if you're ever reading a Cochrane review, they're like 100 pages long. Um, but have good information in them. So that's, I feel like that was very disjointed, but that's basically why critical appraisals. Um, but what I want to talk about as much as critical appraisals today is what tools are there to help you to do this? So what checklist can you use as your critical appraisal tool? Um, and is and a little bit later I'll talk a bit about, okay, never mind. Next week I'll talk a bit about um, uh, systematic review tools like uh, Samari and, and Distiller SR and Rayin and Covenance, which I've heard a lot about from other people. Um, and I have an account on as of like two weeks ago, uh, but have not used. So I should probably stop at this point and say, are there questions about critical appraisals or about anything else we've talked about up to this point in the course? Like, are there concerns about systematic reviews? Are there things that you don't you don't understand or don't know or looking forward you're not sure about? Because this, this is the second last that we have, and I want to make sure that. If I haven't covered it, I do cover it either this week or next. No, I've just been that awesome of a teacher. You guys are just that bored and not paying attention. You're like, maybe I missed it because I was sleeping in class. 
Um, whatever. It's good. I'm happy to have questions, even if even if I'm if I'm, I'm repeating myself. Um, but what critical appraisal tools exist? Uh, the answer is there are a lot of them. I'm going to talk really briefly about four. Um, you can look them up. So sort of your 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 key tools. Uh, Joanna Briggs has a critical appraisal tool. Um, CASP checklists. Uh, CASP is the I'm not remember what it's called. Checklist. Critical Appraisal Skills Program. They have a checklist. Um, the Center for Evidence Based Medicine, or the CEBM. Uh, SIGN, which is the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network, has checklists. Um, I, I expect that NICE does, although I didn't find any. NICE is another guidelines provider. Um, but any major association that deals with systematic reviews will either have their own checklist or will recommend one from another place. Um, And these checklists typically have, say, like, 8 to 12 questions in them. And they're things like, did the article clearly have a clearly focused issue? Um, were all of the participants who entered the trial properly accounted for at the end of the trial? Uh, were the groups similar to start when you had an experiment? You know, were the two groups that start similar enough to make a comparison between them? Um, were the groups treated equally apart from the actual experimental condition? Uh, was the methodology appropriate? So if they did an experimental design, was their, was their design appropriate? If they used qualitative research, um, was their qualitative analysis an appropriate style? Um, depend, and, and, and these questions change depending on what kind of article you're looking at. Um, and the answers are typically sort of yes. Yes, yes, the design was appropriate. Um, no, the design is not appropriate or there was not sufficient information in the article to, dis to determine whether it was appropriate or not. So they have this like if, no, maybe kind of concept to them. Um, I have seen I have seen critical appraisals where it's actually scoring sort of like a scale from 1 to 10. Um, so the one I did for the umbrella review I was part of uh, with someone in nursing had a scale of 1 to 10. And it gave you an idea of sort of what each scale meant, what each score meant. Um, I don't think the ones we're talking about today do that. I've not seen them a lot. But they do exist. They just they add a bit of an ambiguity where you really want a yes, no. Did they do this thing or did they not do it? <clears throat> so the main tools I'm going to talk about are JBI. JBI is the Joanna Briggs Institute. Um, they are a provider of systematic reviews specifically focused on allied health and nursing as opposed to on uh, sort of traditional hardcore medical issues. Um, they have 12 different checklists. And honestly, I think that the hardest part about checklists is figuring out which one to use. Um, and I can't help you with that, so please don't ask me. Oh, sorry. I probably could figure it out, but I'm no better at it than anybody, than anybody else is. Um, so specifically for JBI, their checklists are, there's one for analytical cross-sectional studies, one for case control studies, one for case reports, one for case series, one for cohort studies, one for diagnostic test accuracy studies, one for economic evaluations, one for prevalence studies, one for qualitative research, one for quasi-experimental studies, one for randomized control trials, one for systematic reviews, and one for text and opinion. So it's, it's a lot. Um, and JBI is sort of the most extreme, but most, most most checklist series have more than one checklist, and then they do, and they do vary based on the type of study you're looking at. So you need to know which one you're gonna, which one you're gonna use for each study. You have to, you have to evaluate. Um, some cases it's very easy. If you're doing a qualitative systematic review, you just have to use the qualitative checklist, which is very, very simple and straightforward. If you're doing just RCTs, you only have to use the RCT checklist. If you're being more inclusive, you have to use the other like eight or nine. Um, and JPI. The sort, the sort of positive to JBS 12 checklists is not just their specificity, but they also include a checklist for text and opinion, which, which incorporates uh, great literature. So lots of, lots of checklist systems uh, do not incorporate great literature because it's a hard thing to measure. Um, and I'll mention it again later, but even, even, even when there is a checklist for great literature, it tends to score badly. 
Um, so if you're doing a critical appraisal, it may get screened out anyway, which is a problem because because grade literature is important. It, ha it has value in research. Um, but I'll come back to that a bit later. Uh, but I think of I think of the four checklists I'm going to talk about today. Uh, JPI is the only one that includes grade literature as as a under a category at all, and it's it's under text and opinion, which is kind of shady to begin with. Um, so CASP is the Critical Appraisal Skills Program. Um, it has eight checklists. It does not have a checklist for grade literature. Um, I think going through the 12 checklists before was fine. You don't need me go need to go through another eight, right? They're all kind of the same idea. Um, yeah, CASP, CASP checklists are surprisingly popular. And surprisingly, I will explain why they're surprisingly popular uh, when, we get, when we get to the end of this. Uh, but I, I was shocked when I found something out that I'll show you later. Just keeping some suspense for this very exciting lecture. Um, Center for Evidence Based Medicine, uh, another popular checklist. Um, it only has six pieces, which is nice. Uh, and the really, the really nice thing about the CEBM checklists is that they're translated into a lot of languages. So they're available in like Chinese, German, Lithuanian, Persian, English. Like there's a whole bunch of different translations, which makes it more accessible um, and more, more universal in its application. So you could be doing the same kind of systematic review as someone from another country, as opposed to only using your own country's uh, checklists. Um, I don't think they matter that much because checklists tend not to be super different from each other. They all like we all we all know how to evaluate an article, so that doesn't change a lot. But it's just nice to have the exact same measures across multiple locations. Um, so CEBM does that. Um, and SIGN again, that's the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network. Uh, I never remember what it actually stands for, which is why I have written down in front of me. Um, they're a fairly major organization. Uh, they produce guidelines which are aggregates of systematic reviews, so there are multiple systematic reviews on a topic. Um, for instance, you might get a guideline on treatment of hip fracture, where it covers you know, pre-treatment, getting, getting clinical expertise, like there might be like 15 systematic reviews incorporated into this one guideline. Um, so they're, they're a fairly significant organization, and they have six checklists as well. Um, and all of these checklists are freely, freely available online, you can find them. Um, I will say, don't use the JVI one unless you're doing a JVI review because no one uses it except people who are doing JVI reviews. Um, but all of them are good. And again, they all, they all have fairly similar information requirements in them. Questions? Okay. So the downside to critical appraisal um, is that when and I mentioned this earlier, when there's a gray literature criti critical appraisal tool, gray literature scores badly in it, and that, that discounts gray literature or it de devalues it, um, which in some ways is, is legitimate, and in some ways it isn't. Um, or it, not in some ways it isn't, in some ways it's very unfortunate. So gray literature does tend to have a lower quality than peer-reviewed research does because gray literature is not peer-reviewed, it is not intended for uh, not necessarily intended for the purpose that it's being applied to. Um, but when, when it's devalued in these appraisals, it loses its value in the, in, in the systematic review. And Grey Literature's key purpose in systematic reviews is to balance out the publication bias. It is to incorporate those things that don't tend to get in journals, that, none, that, that still have an effect on the results. So I think back when we talked about Grey Literature, Alex showed a graph where she said, you know, here's, here's the result with its effect size before gray literature, and here's it, here it is after. And it changes the yes to no answer to a question. Like, it actually really does impact the outcomes. Um, and just because it's not peer-reviewed and not, not under the same situation doesn't mean it doesn't have that value. Um, so I don't, know, I don't know that there's an answer to that, because the questions being asked by these critical appraisal checklists are valid and have, and are, are, are they're valid. There's, there's a reason for them. Um, but there's also a very good reason to include great literature. So maybe, yeah, I don't have an answer. Uh, and I don't know that there is an answer. Um, I would say that at some point a decision on, on, a, on, a, on a large scale needs to be made about how to treat great literature in systematic reviews. Like, do you start to 
weighted differently just by nature for being gray literature? Do you like how do you how do you incorporate that? Um, and again, there's no answer, and that's okay. Uh, there's no answer how to incorporate critical appraisals in systematic reviews. Everyone has their own decisions and their own their own preferences. Um, but it's something to be aware of and to consider and to and to understand the context behind it. Um, yeah. And the other the other downside to critical appraisals and systematic reviews is that some topics just don't have good quality research behind them. Um, and that could be because it's just not there yet, or it could be because it's really hard to do good quality research on a topic. There's certain topics that just don't lend themselves to that. But that doesn't that doesn't mean there shouldn't be a systematic review on it. it doesn't mean that a whole lot of low quality research can't actually make a good quality outcome. Um, so they, there's also that that balance to be aware of. Um, in my specific, uh, the example that sort of comes to mind is uh, there's there's emerging research on the effects of needle length um, for intramuscular injections in obese adults. So uh, typically in an obese adult, the standard needle length doesn't actually make it through the fat into the muscle, so that so the injections don't work effectively. But this is something there's, first of all, the standard needle length is the needle length. There isn't, there isn't a longer one unless you specifically request one. Um, and second, it's once, once you know that giving them a shorter needle makes them makes their vaccination not effective or makes their makes their treatment not work. Can you justify doing an experiment on them and giving them a short needle? So there, there's some topics that just don't work well that way, um, and they do they do they do have value in systematic reviews where you pull together all this low low quality evidence to get reasonable quality evidence. Um, but getting good quality evidence at an experimental level isn't really ethical all the time. That's not maybe the best the best example, but it's the one that I had in my brain. So we're gonna we're gonna pretend it's awesome. I'm gonna pause again. <laughs> Questions, concerns. Okay, so this is this is probably gonna be a fairly short class, so I'll apologize for it. Um, but basically, the rest of what I want to talk about is specific cases of including critical appraisals. So I went through several several systematic reviews and looked at what they did, and here's. Here's where we're going. So how do you incorporate them into your systematic review? Obviously the answer is sometimes people don't. Uh, but more often than not, I would say they do. Um, in this case, I'm not even going to try and understand what that topic is, um, but it's by the CJEM journal. And it's a systematic review and meta-analysis. Yeah, I don't know what BLNs are. Um, and I think that this is the entire text in the article that talks about system that talks about critical appraisals. It's not super exciting, um, but I thought I'd put it up there so you can see that they don't make up a significant portion of the writing of an article, but they do make up a significant amount of the effort that goes into it. So you have to score each each article you read. Um, but the actual text in your in your in your paper is not not very broad. Um, so in this case, they use the CASP checklist, which again has a yes, uh, no, or I can't tell kind of option. Um, and in this case, I would say they did, they did a really, really good thing and only included papers if they scored well in CASP. And it, specifically, uh, they, they required all of the answers to have a yes to them. Um, and they did mention that if, if they, if paper didn't have a yes on something that they had a can't tell or maybe, they'd actually contact the author to get more information. Um, Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Some some profs are better at the email than others. Um, but that's that's sort of a, a, I would call that a high ranking treatment of critical appraisal, is that you require them to score well or to score perfectly on all of the CASP checklists. And things kind of go downhill from here, so. Uh, this one from the International Journal of Language and Communication Disorders. Again, very texty slides. Um, it also uses a CASP checklist, checklist, and it it describes the checklist themselves, so like how they're designed and what they mean. Um, it doesn't include or exclude articles based on its checklist, but it does give a report of what the general results of the of the critical appraisal were. So it gives a summary of, you know, these five articles did this, this two these two articles did this. Um, 
this was an issue in like 4% of our articles. Like they have that kind of information, um, which is fairly typical. If they're not going to exclude something from an article entirely, they do summarize how they've how, how the shape of their literature is in terms of critical appraisals. Um, and they did offer a conclusion about how good the literature was overall. So it's saying, you know, our literature was like, was pretty good. It was okay. It was, it was not so great. Um, and because it was okay or pretty good, we drew these conclusions, but they're only like this effective, you know? So there, there is, there is some, some recognition of maybe having good versus low quality research. Um, but not actually cutting out the local quality research. Uh, this one is from the European Journal of Orthopedic Surgery and Traumatology. Um, this one kind of bugged me because I couldn't find anything about which checklist they use until the discussion. That is too late to mention it, put it the methodology, because it is your methodology. Um, but they used CASP too. Um, like the previous paper, they used a discussion of the general outline of, of how their papers scored across the across their papers. So like six did well, these these five had this issue, like this, these were the kinds of things we came across. Um, in this case, they they remarked that there were there was a general amount of weakness across all the studies they reviewed. Like they all had they all had certain weaknesses to them, so they weren't great studies. Um, but again, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't do a systematic review on them. It just means that you need to be more aware of, of the quality behind it. Um, and this one, this one, like I said, uh, it does provide a table of the answers that they got. And, and this is really nice because it tells you what their specific concern, their concerns were in terms of weaknesses. So what were they finding consistently across the multiple studies they looked at that made them think they were weak or poor quality? And they have this table for all of the studies that they reviewed. Um, although I don't remember how many that was specifically, of like two pages. Um, this one from the Journal of Alternative Medicine. Uh, I found this one super shady, but I also found the fact that they were studying mistletoe a little weird. Um, maybe it's legitimate, it just seemed like a really odd title. Uh, what I don't like about this one, and they, they do provide a critical appraisal table like the previous article. Um, they have a summary and text of what they found in, in terms of sort of how the critical appraisals played out. Uh, I do not like the phrase, reluctant to exclude paper on the basis of reporting quality alone, because it might still be relevant to the synthesis. This is basically saying, even though the papers were junk, they looked like they might be useful. And I find that really, really questionable in terms of a decision. Uh, yeah, it's, it's something that I hear uh, from, from grad students sometimes when I'm working with them. They say, oh, but it was really interesting. Uh-huh. It being interesting isn't good enough reason to put it in a systematic review. Um, so that I feel shady. I mean, interesting articles are great. Let's, let's, let's keep some quality. Let's, let's not include it just because it's cool. Yeah. Not that I expected super high quality evidence on a topic about mistletoe. Uh, yeah. Um, this is the JBI review. JBI reviews are typically fairly high quality. They have, they have a lot of really strict guidelines that you have to follow. They actually write most of your paper for you and you fill in the blanks. Like it's it's a weird system you'll find if you look at like three papers and you ran them through a plagiarism software, they'll be like, yeah, these are like 80% plagiarized. Um, but it means that everyone's following the same rules and everyone's doing it exactly as they're supposed to. Uh, this one says that they didn't exclude studies based on critical appraisal, um, but they didn't give an indication in their article of what might have caused them to exclude articles. So it sounded like they said, you know, all of, our, all of the articles we reviewed met our criteria for inclusion in terms of critical appraisal, but didn't mention what that criteria was. Uh, so I found that a little odd. Um, but overall, it was, it, it, it sounded like they would have excluded something if it wasn't good enough, which is a nice, a nice thing to have. 
Um, they do provide a critical appraisal table uh, and a three paragraph summary of the article's critical appraisals across the board. This is another JVI. Um, it's very much the same as it uses the JVI tools. It provides a critical appraisal table, it has a three paragraph summary. Um, and this one actually provides the appraisal scores. And it says there were, it says, uh, this is, we are not looking at the same thing. Yeah, this is what I'm looking at. Um, our, all articles were assessed at levels three and four of JVI's levels of evidence, which is a statement that they all did at least that well. And that's, that's what I like to see. Uh, again, I, I do not hide my biases. I have, I have very definite biases in how things should be done and what, what is good and what is not. So can you tell that I really like it when they cut things out when they're low quality? When they give you specific scores? When they have criteria for exclusion? Uh, I, I, do, I do question not excluding articles that are especially low quality. And I mean, even though we have peer review system, peer review is not perfect, low quality stuff is out there. And low quality isn't always like because it's bad research, research methodology, it could be considered low quality for having biased, biased uh, partisan uh, researchers. So if it's research about a drug by the drug company, there's a bias there that actually gets that's brought out by a critical appraisal. It says, is, do, do the research have a vested interest in, in the outcomes of the study? So this thing, those things come forward when you're doing critical appraisals and they devalue studies. So other ways. So, so far I talked about keeping them all because you want to, uh, getting rid of ones that don't score really well, keeping them, but acknowledge that they're all kind of low quality, but that all of research is low quality, so you're stuck with it. Um, or creating a criterion to cut it off and be like, anything above here gets to, keep, gets to be kept, anything below here gets, gets ditched. Um, yeah, so, other other options, so you do have that you have that cutoff score saying you know anything about before gets to be kept, anything below before gets gets lost. Um, if there's specific questions that you particularly value, you can say if it says no to these two questions, it gets cut. If it says yes, even if it says yes to all the other eight, you you can have one or two questions that really matter to you, and they can be your cutoff values. Um, you can weight your scores in the interpretation, so lower quality evidence can be weighted differently in how you how you synthesize and draw conclusions. Um, and again, you can just not do one. You can, you can skip the critical appraisal stage, uh, although you risk getting that lovely uh, rejected from journals uh, headline. Okay. So I'm gonna pause again. This is like the shortest, shortest class so far. Any questions? We have not. Okay, so um, just, I'm thinking about the way that the working group thing, and what I do is at the end, um, I look at the journals, do the articles that I have at the end, um, and then I compare them against predatoryjournals.com. Okay. And so the advice I was given is, if you find they're from a predatory journal, throw them out, get okay. them out of there. Would you would you agree with that? That's the. Oh boy. Um. Uh, I've never had that question, and uh, sort of on on the fly, how I might treat that. Judging a journal to be predatory is difficult to do, so I, I don't know how PredatoryJournals.com does it. Right. Um, I know the Jeffrey Beals list is now defunct. Jeffrey Beals. Jeffrey. Uh, so the Beals list was was like the authority of sorry, was a popular tool okay. for determining predatory journals. Right. But there's like there's a blacklist. There's I've, I've never heard of predatoryjournals.com. I would say not all articles that go into predator, predatory journals are bad articles. 
they are good articles written by people who don't know better than published in those journals. Um, and it's really, it's really, really flattering to have a journal come to say, you know, I want to publish your article. Let me publish your article. And some people do fall for it. Um, also, like I said, it's, it's hard to judge what, it, what journal is predatory. And some of the criteria being used are not fair. Um, and, and, and again, it depends on where you're going. Um, but I would say two things. First of all, if it passes your critical appraisal, that has significant value. If you think it's a good article by reading it, then maybe it is. And the second thing I would say is, if you're really concerned about predatory journals, and you find out that it's on that list, go and look at the journal it yourself. Um, so there's, there's a website online called Think, Check, Submit, and it gives you guidelines for how to judge predatory journals. And it asks things like, have you heard of the journal before? Um, can you find where they're physically located? Do they have contact information? Do they talk about publishing fees openly? Um, do they talk about their peer review process? Uh, do, they, do they issue regular issues, or do they, do they come out sort of randomly out of in odd intervals. Um, do they publish, you know, 10 articles in an issue, or do they publish just one? Like, so there's all sorts of things you can go and look at, look for yourself. And I just, I don't, I don't trust predatory lists enough to not do that. So I do highly recommend Think, Check, Submit, and making your own judgments on those things. Okay. Um, and standing by them, because I mean, you, you know what, what good stuff looks like. Yeah. Are, are the editors real people? You can, you can do an image search and find out who the person in the picture is, actually is. We, uh, uh, have you heard of them before? Yeah, we, Elaine, we got, uh, we had a predatory journal approach us once. Well, I had the, I had many times, but I, uh, we had only... Well, it was, it was your article. Right, yeah. but I had only followed for once, and I, where I submitted an oh. abstract to them, but I have yeah. really followed them, and uh, uh, submitted an abstract abstract was then I realized I checked around it was a you checked it was a it was a, a deli the location they gave us yeah. was a deli and I wasn't able to find the actual yeah. person's record like the person seemed to exist but what does she do what does she talk I couldn't find so I just emailed back I withdraw my you yeah. know my, my intent to submit I only submitted an abstract and they were very like, oh, could talk and help better? Why? I never respond. I don't want to say you're predatory. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, but we also get some of them quite obvious. I, I get them a lot. Nothing to do with I'm, not, I'm not widely published, and I get predatory contacts a lot. Yeah. yeah. It's as soon as your name's out there, like, oh, look, it's a researcher. Let's, let's even get money out of them. Um, so, for, so for contacts for other people, do you guys know what predatory journals are? So predatory journals, or um, our communication, or sorry, our scholarly communications expert calls them bad faith publishers, are publishers that reach out to people for articles, get the articles, don't go through appropriate peer review, and are paid to publish them. Um, so as, as a researcher, I might get an email saying, oh, we saw this article you wrote, we really want to publish you, send us your stuff, and I send it to them. They say they peer review, and then they don't. Then they ask me for money to publish it. And I pay them, and it either it's published or not. It's not copy edited. Like you, do, you don't know what they're doing on the other side. It is a fully like back end, not legitimate publishing system um, that comes from uh, a, a movement that's actually really, really positive. So this movement in in publishing, sorry, not in publishing, they hate it. This movement in academia towards making our research free, so publishing freely, so that people who are paying taxes to fund the research to actually get to see it instead of having to go through paywalls like like the, the, the disgusting amounts of money that the university pays to give you access to journal articles. Um, so there's a movement to make stuff available to the public that's not been available to them in the past. Uh, but that means that researchers have to pay to publish. They have to pay to make it available because there's a cost associated with publishing that that's still real. Like even, even though it's not print publishing, even though it's online, there is a significant cost to publishing. Not as big as the journals want us to think it is. Um, so there, there, there are legitimate times when you would pay for research to be published, and because there's legitimate times, someone's definitely gonna make a scam to make it possible to get paid for not pub properly, properly publishing. And it's kind of the basic idea. It's, it's the dark side of like being scammed for publications. Um, and yeah, people fall for it. It's really, really nice to get an email saying, oh, we thought your article was brilliant. We want to, we want to publish you. If someone ever does that, ask some questions, because no one does that. 
Like no legitimate publisher is gonna go gonna go looking for you. They have enough people coming to look for them. Uh, special exceptions being things like special issues for a journal. So if you have a major journal doing a special issue on a topic and you're, pr you're a primary researcher in that topic, they might reach out to you, but mostly that doesn't happen. So predatory journals still, still, still end up online, they're still findable. So you can still be, you can still be reading articles from them. Um, and that, that's, what it's, that's what he's asking is, you know, if I find it as predatory, should I still cite it? And my answer is, people publish in those journals by mistake. Don't, don't judge the article based on what it's published in, although do, do ask questions, do engage, with the, do engage with the literature, find out the journals that are legitimate, like just do your, do your due diligence. But if you think the article's good, you know what good articles look like. And I wonder sometimes whether it's like if you were this predatory enough, it was one conference that I looked at from a society, I don't know if it's that, if it's a big society, it's like a lot of conferences have their own journal. So it's Google and they're just checking. First it seemed legit, like they have this big name with that tent, but then it's suspicion being predatory, like, you know, You could be safe, like anything that's iffy, I will not argue can decide to But I do agree, I read some of the journal, not too bad, better than some psych, psych uh, record mm -hmm. article um, online like that. But yeah, certain that clearly, like downgrading on top of the daily fake editor name, you know, that's a really common. But some of the like, the people who are psychologists are in the field trying to. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there, there are predatory conferences too. Like, there, there's always a chance for, like, sketchy things to happen online, right? It's just that's just the world we live in. Um, if you are ever concerned about a journal that reaches out to you, or that you want you want to use an article from, or you're just concerned about a journal in general, you can reach out to me, and I'll take a look at it. Um, and if I don't know the answer, I'll reach out to our scholarly communications expert who specializes in dealing with open access and predatory journals, and, and that, that's, that's his area. And he's very, very good at it. That was a long answer to a short question. No, that's great. Other, other questions? OK, so I actually had an activity for today where I chose an article, um, and I'll that's what it's called. And I want you to look at the article and then look at the CASP checklist and the JVI checklists and just think about how you might appraise that article. So, so do the appraisal in your head, take a look at the checklists. Um, really learn about the process because I can talk about it, but I can't actually do it for you. Um, and the one thing I meant to mention earlier uh, that, I, that I said I was going to mention later, which is, yeah, so CASP. I was very, very intrigued by the fact that CASP is so popular for systematic review checklists. Um, when on their first page, they say, these checklists were designed to be used as educational pedagogic tools as part of a workshop setting. They were never intended for systematic reviews. That is not their purpose. And they're very, very popular for it. Um, so I found that just interesting. They said, we do not suggest a scoring system. So, very, very popular, but when you download it, that's the first thing you read. Like, it's, it's, it's right there. So, I found that interesting. But yeah, so take some time, take a look at this article, and take a look at the checklist and figure out, and think about how you might go about doing that and what, yeah, just try it. That's all I have to say. <laughs>